Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. The mother of a man scheduled to be executed in Terre Haute next week says she's giving up hope that her son's life will be spared. The only thing that my son has said that he's deeply remorseful for the pain that he's caused the family. Coming up more on the men scheduled to be executed next week, barring clemency from the president. A team led by the Indianapolis Zoo is removing all the animals from a Southern Indiana Wildlife Center. A warning to all such operations in the United States that they should stop doing this immediately. What's going to happen to the animals and the facility's controversial owner just ahead? Plus, the Hoosiers will play football this fall. We are so much better and so much more prepared today than we were 43 days ago. There'll be fewer games, no fans, and numerous health safety checks. All the details coming up. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Well, the counties that include Indiana and Ball State Universities are listed as the highest risk locations for coronavirus infections in the state. The state's COVID-19 map shows two counties in orange, Monroe County, which includes the main Indiana University campus in Bloomington, and Delaware County, which includes Ball State and Muncie. The orange rating means moderate to high coronavirus spread. Most of the new cases are occurring among young people, particularly those who live in congregate living on college campuses. We're especially concerned about our 18 to 22 year old age group. Our case counts since early August have trended down for all ages except this one. We have seen sharp increases in this age group as universities have required testing and students have returned to campus. Bach says the state is also seeing a steady increase in cases in children. So far this month, the 0 to 19 and 20 to 29 year old age groups represent nearly half of new COVID-19 cases. Now, while there are not a lot of hospitalizations among young people, Bach says they need to realize they are not without risk. This is likely because these age groups are less likely to observe social distancing, don't wear their masks regularly, and have larger social bubbles. The state is still waiting to see if there will, if there were be an influx of new cases tied to the Labor Day holiday. There was a surge in cases following Memorial Day and July 4th. Well, two inmates have died from the coronavirus at the Terre Haute prison complex, where two executions are planned for next week. Another 40 plus inmates at the facility currently have confirmed cases of COVID-19. The virus deaths are likely to raise alarm with advocates and lawyers for the condemned men over the spread of the virus. Advocates for two of the men executed in, in July fought unsuccessfully to delay their executions over coronavirus concerns. Execution witnesses are required to wear masks and their temperatures are taken before they are permitted on the prison grounds. The federal prison system has struggled to combat the coronavirus pandemic behind bars where social distancing is nearly impossible. The mother of one of the two inmates who was scheduled to be executed Thursday at the federal penitentiary in Terre Haute is pleading with President Trump to spare his life. Adam Pinsker reports. In 2000, Christopher Vialva was 19 when a federal court sentenced him to death for shooting Todd Bagley in the head near Fort Hood, Texas. The court says that Vialva and some other teens also killed Bagley's wife and set their vehicle on fire with their bodies inside the car. Three other teens who were under 18 at the time were sentenced to lengthy prison terms. Another man, Brandon Bernard, is also in death row for his role in the crime. Now, Chris's mom says that her son has come a long way since being sent to this facility 20 years ago and that his life should be spared. 
For the last two decades, any time Lisa Brown visited her son, it was inside the concrete walls of the United States Penitentiary in Terre Haute. When Christopher first got there, it was um, less than a year before Timothy McVeigh was executed. McVeigh was sentenced to death for firebombing a federal building in Oklahoma City, killing 168 people in 1995. Brown says Vialva also knew to one degree or another Every man who's been executed since McVeigh, including the last inmate to be put to death, Keith Nelson. Vialva told his mom he saw Nelson hours before his execution last month. And he said he started violently vomiting in his cell. And he said it was just horrific. And he said that the staff kind of played it off as he'd eaten something bad. But he said he knew it was Keith's nerves. Lisa says her son made an effort to get to know everyone on the range, as it is called, the section of this sprawling complex near the Wabash River that houses some of the 57 inmates on federal death row. Nearly half of them are black, including Christopher, who is biracial and will be the first black man executed by the federal government since 2003. Just this week, the Death Penalty Information Center released a report showing a long history of racial disparity in how the death penalty is applied to black people. You've got to be able to apply it fairly, consistently, in a non-discriminatory way. The Alva's case ended up in the federal system because his crime occurred on a military reservation. Like the five other men executed before him, those defendants were also convicted of committing a federal crime, such as kidnapping and carjacking while committing murder. These cases are bad cases. There's no question about that. Uh, but that doesn't make them federal cases. And they're the type of cases that are traditionally handled by state courts. Brown says she only talked to her son's defense attorney once during his trial and says her son contracted meningitis at birth and suffered brain damage as a result, but the issue never came up during the trial. What I've been told is the trial attorneys chose not to have him evaluated. Lisa says despite his two decades behind bars, she remains close to her son and has seen him transform into a different person. The first couple of years I can remember he was very angry. During his time behind bars, Vialva became a Messianic Jew and spent two years convincing prison staff to allow him to conduct weekly services. Now he ministers regularly to fellow inmates. Eight of those inmates wrote character statements about Christopher. All of them detailed the positive impact he had on them. The people that knew him, um, like, decades ago would go, oh my gosh, that, you know, where's the guy that, that we grew up with? We asked Lisa if her son takes responsibility for his role in the murders of Todd and Stacy Bagley. The only thing that my son has said that he's deeply remorseful for the pain that he's caused the family and, and me. Uh, with his actions that day. Christopher has access to email and phone calls while on death row, and despite being confined for two decades, he speaks to his mother every day, and she visits him as much as she can. He and I have always been very, very close. We can, we have the kind of relationship that we can just about complete each other's sentences. But as Vialva's execution date draws near, Lisa says she frustrated her son is more resigned to facing his own death than she is. Of course, that's hard for me to accept because my flesh is selfish and I want him here with me. Barring clemency from President Trump, Vialva will be executed by lethal injection this Thursday. Another man, William LaCroix, is set to be executed this Tuesday here in the same facility for murdering and raping a Georgia woman in 2001. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. Indiana health officials are developing the criteria they will use to decide who is entitled to receive a coronavirus vaccine when one becomes available. If the vaccine is, distri is distributed to each state based on population. Indiana might receive only 300,000 doses for 6.7 million residents. State health officials are working to identify which Hoosiers should get vaccine priority and who can continue following COVID-19 prevention practices until a vaccine is more widely available. 
Well, one of the personalities from the popular Netflix series Tiger King faces allegations of neglect and animal abuse and remains at large with a warrant out for his arrest. Tim Stark is the owner of Wildlife in Need, a small zoo just outside of Charlestown, Indiana, that houses hundreds of exotic animals. As Ethan Burks reports, more than 160 of those animals have been removed from Stark's property this week after he lost numerous battles in court against the Indiana Attorney General's Office, the USDA, and PETA. Over the last several days, trucks have been going in and out removing animals from the Wildlife in Need property. Police are stationed at the entrance to the facility to help keep everyone else out. Right behind me, a couple hundred yards down this gravel road, is Tim Stark's Wildlife in Need Animal Sanctuary, where Stark himself isn't allowed to be between the hours of 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. per a court order while they're removing animals from his own property. The Office of the Attorney General filed a lawsuit against Stark back in February for allegedly abusing animals. Mac Holsey owns the land adjacent to Wildlife in Need. He says in the three decades he's been Stark's neighbor, he's never once witnessed Stark abuse animals. Tim Stark is a good man at heart. You know, he he talks a little rough sometimes, but uh, he, has a, he has a real passion for his animals. Several local residents sat along the road to wildlife in need, showing their support for Stark and the animals. Jordan Nart has been a volunteer at the facility for four years. I can't believe it's happening. I don't think it's right. He says all the animals have been treated with love and care as long as he's been there. I honestly think it's wrong, it's not fair, and our justice system is broken. He deserves a trial before these babies should be removed from this property. Last week, a Marion County judge appointed the Indianapolis Zoological Society to remove the animals from Stark's property. But the AG's office filed an emergency motion earlier this week saying some of the animals were missing from the site. The office says some of the animals were later found in the back of a closed box truck right outside Stark's property. The statement says the animals lack food, water, lights, and ventilation. Stark says he wasn't trying to hide the animals from authorities, and several of his neighbors say Stark wouldn't purposely mistreat any animal. He left here the other morning almost in tears. And, and they know deep down there's a lot of them that know the real Tim. They're not worried about him d doing something violent against them. I mean, they got cops crawling everywhere back there. The Indianapolis Zoo is in charge of deciding where the animals go, but PETA has the rights to the big cats. In 2017, PETA filed a lawsuit against Stark for violating the Endangered Species Act for declawing lions and tigers, separating the infants from their mothers, and then using those cubs for petting sessions. Which are paid events where a room full of 30 to 50 people poke and prod and take photographs and just generally be loud and play with cubs and keep them awake far too many hours of the day and, and come into direct contact with them. PETA says it plans to move Stark's cats to accredited zoos and sanctuaries that have proper resources to house and take care of them. But local residents worry that's not best for the animals. Let's follow these cats. Let's see where PETA takes them. Let's see what they do with them and, and how much money is involved in where they go or, or how it's done. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ethan Burks. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has also cited Stark for more than 100 violations against the Animal Welf Wel Welfare Act. The result of those proceedings say Stark will not be allowed to own any animals under the act, which includes big cats. A warrant is still out for Stark's arrest, according to the Indiana AG, because they can't locate all the animals. Anyone who sees Stark has been instructed to contact law enforcement. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. A Bloomington councilman is apologizing to his constituents after a proposed tax increase to help fund efforts to fight climate change fails to garner enough support. And the IU Marching 100 is preparing for Big Ten football to resume next month. And in a season marked by uncertainty, they're adapting so the show can go on. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU news team is where you are and telling your story.
there's never been a more important time to make sure facts and the truth are driving conversation. Washington Week is an island of civil discourse in a chaotic media environment. On Friday night, we gather the best reporters in the nation to unpack what's really happening and have a conversation that's not about point of view, but about informing the American people. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Indiana Attorney General Curtis Hill would rather a court eliminate the current vote by mail option for Hoosiers aged 65 or older than allow every eligible voter to cast a mail in ballot. That's from an ongoing lawsuit aimed at expanding vote by mail for the fall election. The people suing to expand Indiana's vote by mail argue that the 26th Amendment, which sets the voting age at 18, means the state can't limit mail in voting by age. Republican candidate Todd Rokita says he hasn't read Hill's brief, but he doesn't want to see any changes to Indiana's election system this close to Election Day. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have um, uh, the facilities. We don't have the person power to conduct a mail election uh, accurately without fraud. Indiana expanded vote by mail to all voters who wanted it for the 2020 primary. Republicans have blocked all efforts to do so for the general election. Democratic AG candidate Jonathan Weinzapfel calls Hill's position short-sighted, pure, purely political, and dangerous. A proposal that would have raised taxes for all Monroe County residents failed this week. The tax hike was part of Mayor John Hamilton's Recover Forward plan to help fund issues such as climate change, economic stability, and social justice during the pandemic. The mayor says he's disappointed the proposal failed, and as Ethan Burks reports, he issued a warning about the challenges that lie ahead. The mayor's proposal would have increased local income taxes by a quarter percent. It would have generated about $8 million dollars, $4 million of which would have been allocated to the city, while the rest of the funds would have gone to the county. The Bloomington City Council's final vote was 4-5 to five against the tax increase. If the council had garnered just 8 votes in support of the proposal, it would have raised income taxes across the entire county, given its power over the local income tax council. The way the state of Indiana's local income taxes are set up, Bloomington holds 58% of the voting shares over the rest of Monroe County. It's a countywide issue. It affects every Monroe County resident. Ellettsville area businesses do not support the tax increase. Bloomington's Chamber of Commerce also came out against the proposal. Councilmember Jim Sims said some of the issues the proposal aimed at were too large and needed more collaboration with institutions outside the area. Bloomington City does not operate in a vacuum, but it has to be broader in order to uh, work toward solving some of the, the climate change and greenhouse gas issues. The mayor himself criticized the council for voting against his proposal and, in his own words, not stepping up in a time of multiple crisis to take care of residents. In a statement he wrote, quote, My administration as a whole and I personally remain committed to these vital causes. I'm very concerned that without these funds, we will face serious challenges to navigate troubled waters ahead, unquote. Councilmember Matt Flaherty supported the idea and says even though the legislation failed, the community will still need to address the problem of climate change in the future. This isn't nebulous, it's here and now, it's, it's people, and it's most of all for the next generation. Um, and, and to that generation, just for the, for the historical record, I'm sorry, you know, we're trying. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ethan Burks. Big Ten football is back on the calendar for the fall, but it will be unlike any other season. The Hoosiers will play their first game in little over a month. Players will receive daily COVID-19 testing. The conference will use that data to determine if it's safe to continue practices and games. As Pat Bean reports, the Big Ten approved a list of protocols that teams must follow. If all goes as planned, the Hoosiers will kick off their season in a little more than a month. That's about six weeks late due to the coronavirus pandemic. You know, it's, it's football and it's, it's fun, it's exciting. We're, we're definitely thrilled to be back, you know, so. But. There won't be any tailgating or fans. Ultimately, though, that could work in the Hoosiers' favor. An empty stadium means less of a home field advantage for schools such as Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State. All three have stadiums that seat more than 100,000, and unlike Indiana, they regularly fill them. And that could help a team like Indiana, which this year will play at Ohio State, a place where it has won just once in the past 69 years. I think there's no question it's going to be a variable because, you know, that, that's a huge advantage that those teams have when they have, you know, 100-plus thousand fans in, in attendance. Um, 
Yeah, just the energy that you get from that as a home team. Uh, there's no question it makes it really hard to play there. That Indiana and the rest of the Big Ten teams are playing was anything but certain after the league suspended its season on August 11th. But with a rigorous COVID-19 testing program in place, the Big Ten unanimously voted to begin the season. We are so much better and so much more prepared today than we were 43 days ago. In addition to players, all staff will also be tested daily. And whether teams can keep competing will be determined by positivity rate and population positivity rate based on a seven-day rolling average. Those rates are divided into three categories, green, orange, and red. If both numbers fall within the green or green-orange range, competition continues normally. However, if the numbers rise into the orange or orange-red range, teams must enhance their COVID-19 prevention. And if the numbers reach red status, a team positivity rate over 5% and a population positivity rate over 7.5%, teams must halt competition for at least a week. Keeping the positivity rates down for student athletes likely means them being less of a student and more of an athlete. The biggest thing, though, to me is is just the challenges of staying away from large group gatherings. And that's where it's got to be disciplined. And as we, we've been very, very straightforward about that. If they care about this team, they care about wanting to have a season, they care about wanting to, to be a part of a, you know, a great 2020 football year, then they're going to have to make some sacrifices. Another concern is getting up to game speed after not practicing for more than a month. How much seating is too much to where you, know, you, you beat yourself up and lose guys to games because of that. And then if you don't hit enough, then your kids aren't ready to play a Big Ten football game. But for now, the Hoosiers are excited just to be back on the field. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Pat Bean. Also this week, the NCAA announced men's and women's basketball games can begin on November 25th. That's two weeks later than originally scheduled due to the coronavirus pandemic. All other fall sports have been moved to the spring. Well, when the Big Ten postponed football this fall, a big part of Indiana University's game day wasn't sitting on the sidelines. Indiana's marching band hasn't stopped, but is adapting to the new normal. The parking lot at Indiana University's Memorial Stadium isn't supposed to be empty this time of year. There's no tailgating or smoke wafting from grills. No fans in red and white throwing footballs waiting for kickoff. Traditions like the walk will have to wait a few more weeks. Instead, COVID-19 testing signs point to IU's mitigation site inside the stadium. But on a weekday afternoon, a familiar game day sound might get your attention. The IU's Marching 100 is still practicing in its usual outdoor lot, providing a little relief to this year's somber reality. One minute and then you'll be swapping roles. If you are marching, you'll be playing. And if you are playing, you will be marching. IU senior drum major Jacob Kessler says being around other band members is a big motivator. He says many haven't been able to play their instruments with other people since March. It's completely different to be surrounded by your best friends or, or new people, the, the freshmen, the rookies uh, that you've never been able to talk to before and just socialized and do something you love. Kessler says the staff spent the summer researching the science behind aerosols and the band feels safe practicing outside. There's an online version of rehearsals too, but so far no one has opted out for meeting in person. Eric Smedley is in his first year directing the band. I mean, you go around campus, there's not a whole lot going on. And, you know, we thought, well, we can help with that. The Marching 100 is a no contact sport of sorts, even though it's not part of the athletic department. Students get tested just like everyone else on campus. Band members wear masks with small slits for instrument mouthpieces. And there's a, an inherent discipline to it, right? I mean, they know they have to stand in this spot and they don't move around. You know, it, it's easier to control that amount of people in a marching band setting. And the instruments have masks too. IU adorned bell covers are new this year. Smedley has also had to figure out how to conduct rehearsals with 275 band members when the county's health department is limiting the outdoor gathering sizes to 150. We're just never all doing something at the same time. You know, the most will be that 150, and even then I've got them spread out um, six and a half feet side to side and uh, double that front to back. The biggest change is showtime. The band won't march and play at the same time. 
That's to keep each other's aerosol paths from crossing. The music and marching will be recorded separately and edited together for the stadium big screen, and some pieces will be shared on social media. We're going to record uh, pregame like you would see uh, at a football game, and we're also going to record three halftime shows. Um, and also we're going to do a couple of concerts around campus. It's mixed emotions for band members who are trying to meet their mental health and academic needs. In your nose, out your mouth, deep breath. Senior year Mellophone staff member Lisa Carey says she feels safe and for someone who was training to be a high school band director, the pandemic has created quite a learning experience. I think it's this year shifting the focus to no, it's about community health, it's about preserving our health, things of that nature. I think that's that's the biggest shift for me. It's been different, um, but but the the great thing about this is it's a new challenge, you know, it's a new challenge. Um, one that I don't think anyone as a teacher could have foreseen in their, their teaching career. The band is working on the pregame show and started practicing music for the first halftime show this week. Ain't no mountain high enough, I'm still standing, and we found love. They plan to perform through November. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members, thank you.